Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to the HAI Weekly Research uh, Seminar. Uh, my name is Francis Pearman, and I'm an assistant professor of education in the Graduate School of Education uh, here at Stanford. Uh, so social scientists have long known that patterns in access to quality educational opportunities uh, reflect existing inequalities along lines of race uh, and class. Uh, children of color and children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds are generally exposed to fewer of the kinds of enriching and supportive learning environments and educational opportunities uh, that support all aspects of healthy uh, development. But what we have come to learn over the last past decade or so is uh, the extent to which these opportunities are also spatialized, uh, that there exists, as Bill Tate calls it, a geography of opportunity in the United States. If you want to know where a child will wind up in life, uh, one needs to look no further uh, than where the child grows up. Children who grow up in low-income neighborhoods generally fare worse in life uh, than children living elsewhere. Uh, children growing up in higher income places uh, fare better. And these impacts are causal, meaning places affect outcomes. Uh, there are a number of reasons why places affect outcomes. Uh, places impact the kinds of stressors you're exposed to uh, growing up in a safe neighborhood, places where children are exposed to very little trauma, crime, um, uh, and other forms of instability can uh, help provide a stable uh, foundation that can promote works and bolster children's potential to learn and grow. Uh, places impact the types of people you're able to be around, uh, right? If you grow up, say, around inventors, as Raj Chetty and colleagues have found, you're likely to become an inventor yourself. Uh, finally, places impact the types of schools uh, children attend, and attending a high-quality school has a positive impact on a host of outcomes that we care about. But not everyone grows up in a safe neighborhood, uh, lives near inventors, or is able to attend high-quality schools. Indeed, one of the most significant blemishes associated with the geography of opportunity in the United States uh, today is that much of it remains plagued by segregation. Uh, it is not just that some children have less educational opportunities than others, it is that segregation itself has systematically shortchanged entire subgroups of children, uh, many of them black and brown and many of them low income. Uh, one of the most significant challenges today for community members, policymakers, politicians, and social scientists alike uh, is coming up with strategies and solutions for improving the geography of opportunity in the United States in such a way that makes it more likely that children from historically marginalized backgrounds are able to realize their full potential and, trans, uh, and transform uh, the very conditions that ward against their potential in the first place. Professor Irene Lowe's uh, recent work, the work that she will share with us today, is situated at this very location. She is engaged in some of the most innovative work to date on how school systems can overcome the twin dilemmas of res uh, residential segregation and disinvestment in their communities to promote educational opportunities for all children. Uh, there's another key contribution that Professor Lowe is making uh, as machine learning, artificial intelligence, and computational methods are growing in influence in educational settings, factoring ever more so in the policies and practices that shape school life. Um, Professor Lowe is modeling for current and future scholars uh, the ways these tools can be used to advance matters of equity, uh, fairness, and justice. In today's seminar, uh, Professor uh, Lowe will share uh, her work uh, in partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District to design a new policy for student assignment system, for a school assignment system uh, that meets the district's goals of diversity, uh, predictability predictability and proximity. Uh, before we begin the presentation, uh, a few logistics. Uh, you can use the Zoom chat to message the group, uh, but please use the QR code uh, on the screen to ask questions through Slido, or you can click on the link uh, that will be in that chat uh, in the chat shortly. Uh, I'll be choosing questions from Slido after the presentation. Slido has a nice upvote feature uh, so that you can choose questions uh, all of you are most interested in. A closed captioning uh, has uh, been enabled for the webinar. Uh, for this webinar, uh, simply click the CC feature on your Zoom screen uh, to show captions uh, throughout the hour. Uh, Irene, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, feel free to share your screen uh, and begin. Great, thank you so much, Professor Pierman, for that uh, very generous and informative introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So just give me one moment. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for this HAI seminar, where I'll be telling you today about some of the work we've been doing with the San Francisco School District uh, to design their school choice and student assignment policies for diversity. And this is based on the work I'll be presenting today is joint work with a number of my colleagues, including my co-PI Itai Shalagi and a large number of students. And there are many more people who have been involved in uh, some of the uh, prior and ongoing work, which I'll talk about today as well. 
And so Alvin did a great job, uh, Professor Pierman did a great job situating and motivating the problem for us, but let me uh, just tell you a little bit more about the problem that we're trying to address today. So the problem is that schools across the United States are segregating. In fact, they're not just segregating, they're resegregating. So what I'm showing you here um, is a plot of the black students in minority schools. Uh, so this by minority school, I mean the schools with at least 90% of students from underrepresented racial groups. And I'm plotting for you the percentage of black students in those schools from, uh, um, this is, uh, around the time of the Brown versus Board ruling in 1954, that school segregation is unconstitutional through to 2011. And you can see that this percentage has been decreasing until about the 80s and then increasing again since then. So this is just one cut of the data showing that um, schools across the US have been resegregating uh, here racially and also socioeconomically. To give another example, this is a different a slice of the data from the San Francisco Unified School District specifically. Here I'm showing you the percentage of uh, schools in the district where a rac one racial or ethnic subgroup comprises at least 45% of the students going to that school. So you can think of this as kind of a measure of concentration of, uh, of race in schools. And you can see that has also been decreasing to the 80s and then increasing again since then. And so there are many reasons why this kind of segregation might be problematic. Uh, one reason is that there is recent research at the Stanford Educational Opportunity Project that shows that when you have the confluence of socioeconomic segregation as well as racial segregation in schools, that is the concentration of racial minorities in high poverty schools, this is highly correlated with the highest achievement gaps. And so just to kind of give a sense of the scale, uh, DC Public Schools is one of the districts with one of the uh, largest uh, incidences of uh, white black segregation. And there the white black uh, educational achievement gap uh, is about five grade levels. Okay. So, so this is the problem that we're trying to address today. And the way we're going to try to tackle this question is through student assignment policy. So what is student assignment policy? Student assignment policy is the process or the policy that determines how students get to choose which schools they go to. And so uh, that, that phrasing might be a little bit strange to some of you who maybe grew up with neighborhood assignment. And so by neighborhood assignment here, you don't really have a choice. Uh, you just go to the school that's close to where you live. So, so we draw a catchment area around each school or a neighborhood around each school. And if you live in this catchment area, then that's the school you go to. And this is a uh, one uh, predominant way of assigning students to schools. And the goal here is that we can let students go to a school that's close to home. Now, the problem with neighborhood assignment is that, well, if our neighborhoods are segregated, then our schools are going to inherit that segregation. And so another type of policy that has been uh, considered more in the past few decades has been school choice. The idea here is I'm going to let students choose where they want to go to school across the whole district. Operationally, this means I let students submit some preferences to a, a centralized, uh, uh, often a student assignment uh, center, and then an algorithm takes all those preferences and decides where the students get to go to school. And so why might we think that school choice is a good alternative to neighborhood assignment? First, in the district of New York City, here I'm assigning students to public high schools in New York City, and there are about 80,000 students who are choosing between over 700 programs at over 400 high schools. And so one reason in New York City you might think choice is a good idea is that choice lets families express preferences over schools. We have these 700 programs, 400 high schools. They uh, differ by the, the program features, such as the academic opportunities at those schools, uh, the course offerings. There's also the uh, art schools, science schools. And so different families may find that different schools are a better fit for their child. And so choice allows families to express this preference in a way that a, a central planner may not be able to predict beforehand. Uh, but another reason that we might want to use choice is uh, in the San Francisco School District. 
Here, uh, this district is about an order of magnitude smaller, about 5,000 students entering uh, kindergarten or about 5,000 students entering ninth grade. And in San Francisco, one of the primary goals of enabling choice was so that we could disentangle neighborhood and school segregation. Okay, what do I mean by that? We look at this plot over here. I'm showing you 2010 census block data where each dot uh, is a family and the color of the dot indicates the race of that family. And so you can really very clearly visually see the patterns of racial segregation in terms of where people are living. So just to point one of these out, if we look at our black students, they comprise just 5% of the school going population in San Francisco, but you can see that they're really concentrated in a small number of parts of the district, including down here in the southeast. And this will become important when I also talk about the patterns of socioeconomic segregation as well in just a few slides. Okay, so the goal here is that uh, our neighborhoods are clearly segregated. Uh, perhaps if we allow students to express preferences over schools across the whole district, we can teeth couple and disentangle our school segregation from our neighborhood segregation. Okay, so the, here are the reasons you might consider school choice as a student assignment policy rather than neighborhood assignment. And so today what I'm going to do is uh, talk about this particular case study with the San Francisco Unified School District. And I'll tell you a little bit about the context and then also about how we suggested uh, new policies beyond just neighborhood assignment and uh, full district-wide choice in the San Francisco context and how we used AI and optimization to inform the, the suggestion of the policies and the evaluation of the policies. And then I'll tell you some of the results from our investigation, as well as the policy decision that that informed and the ongoing policy implementation and the support we've been giving for that. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into the case study for the San Francisco School District. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Slido. Uh, if you have clarifying questions, you can also put them in there now. Um, and Professor Fearman will be moderating uh, the, both the clarifying questions throughout the talk, as well as the Q&A at the end of the talk. Okay. So just to give a little additional context on San Francisco. Uh, like many cities across the US, San Francisco has a, a history of residential segregation, and, and much of this history has been uh, systematically imposed by, uh, for example, government policies. So what I'm showing you on the left here is, is a redlining map from the 1930s. Now, for those of you who don't know what redlining is, it was a, a systemic and systematic policy uh, that was where government uh, uh, decision makers, as well as the homeowners uh, loan corporation, outlined it in red some of the residential areas across many different districts, and then systematically limited the financial resources available to people living in those districts. So things such as banking, insurance, value of land and residence, uh, prospect of development. And so People living in these residences, which were often predominantly black, uh, were systematically denied these uh, the access to uh, resources that would enable them to develop wealth. And so what this redlining has done has systematically introduced geographic inequality and socioeconomic status. And, and this inequality has persisted through to the present day. What I'm showing you on the right here is a map from 2020 of the students who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch in the district. And so the yellow dots here are the students who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. This is a measure of socioeconomic need. Uh, and then the, the blue dots represent students who do not um, have that eligibility. And so you can see rather upsettingly that this, uh, the, the yellow dots here really map very well onto the red line districts from the 30s. So, so this history of socioeconomic segregation has persisted to the present day. And so going back to the geography of racial segregation, you see that our black students are really concentrated as well down here in the Southeast, which is also where we have a concentration of um, our poor families. 
And so this is the residential segregation in San Francisco. And what about our schools? What I'm showing you here now is um, some, some pictures of school segregation in 2018. So by 2018, there had been a system of district-wide choice in place for about seven years since 2011. And so what I'm showing you here are, are both residential segregation and school segregation after choice. Specifically on the left here, I'm showing you two things on top of each other. Uh, both of these measure the percentage of African American, Latinx, and Pacific Islander students. On the bottom, I have a heat map. This is the, the percentage of these uh, racial groups who reside in these areas of the district. And then the blue dots here are the 50% of schools which have the highest percent of such students attending those schools. Okay, so you can see that the blue dots are basically overlaid on top of the darkest parts of the heat map, which show us that the, the schools are still reflecting the racial segregation of the neighborhoods. On the right, I've done the same thing with the percentage of students eligible for free or reduced price lunch. And again, you see that the dark red dots are basically on top of the darker parts of the heat map. So racial and socioeconomic segregation at um, the residential level seems to be persisting at schools even after choice. And so because of this observed issue with the student assignment system, uh, in 2018, the San Francisco Unified School District uh, School Board put forth a resolution to redesign student assignment toward diversity, predictability, and proximity, and all with a lens of equity of access. And when they put forward this uh, resolution, there are some questions about what kind of policy might achieve all district goals. If we think back to our standard policy, so we think about neighborhood assignment, uh, the problem with neighborhood assignment is that even though it gives predictability and proximity because you get to go to your neighborhood school and that school is very close, uh, when neighborhoods are segregated, the schools are also segregated. And so neighborhood assignment is not diverse and uh, it may also provide barriers to, uh, for e equity of access. If we look at district-wide choice, one of the hopes was that disentangling your school from where you lived would allow the, the schools to be more, sec uh, more integrated in the neighborhoods. But what we saw in 2018 was that school choice was not achieving any of the district goals of diversity, predictability, proximity, or equity of access. Put another way, neighborhood assignment faced the challenge of residential segregation, and, and district-wide choice faced the challenge of, of what we observed in our data uh, that is choice-driven segregation. And so the, the district had uh, this initial set of policy concepts where the idea was we're gonna do something in between neighborhood assignment and district by choice. We're going to uh, restrict choice, not to just a, a neighborhood with one school, but to a zone with multiple schools. And so the hope is that if these zones are big enough, they can overcome residential segregation. But if they're small enough and we put some other controls in choice, then perhaps we can overcome choice-driven segregation. And so this is the context into which we entered and uh, started thinking about, well, what policies are possible and how can we explore this particular set of policies using AI and optimization? Okay. Um, any clarifying questions at this point, uh, Francis? Seems like no, so I'm going to keep yeah, no, going. No, no questions. Great. Uh, so before I jump into telling you what we did, let me tell you a little bit about the existing literature on student assignment policies. Uh, there is a, a large space of empirical literature sort of looking at what policies are out there and why we should care about student assignment and why we should care about segregation. So I'll just highlight a few of the findings from that literature. Uh, first, as I've already mentioned, the largest racial achievement gaps occur when students from racial minorities are concentrated in high poverty schools. 
Uh, now, when we think about uh, districting, zoning, and neighborhood schools in particular, uh, there have been nationwide studies that show that, that school zones have historically been gerrymandered to support the choices of families of means. And so this particular policy, type of policy we're looking at today, has actually been used historically to exacerbate the geography of inequality. Uh, and, and so there's, I think, uh, it's really important to think, then think about, well, how, how can we use this policy in the other direction to actually mitigate this geography of inequality? Uh, in our own work, but also in other work, it has also been shown that families uh, may choose in ways that, that segregate, so um, that segregate across racial or socioeconomic factors. Now, if we go to the literature on school choice, as I mentioned at the beginning, Primarily how school choice is operationalized is that people put their preferences into an algorithm and then the algorithm decides where students get to go to school. And so there are a couple of other inputs to this algorithm that can also be designed by a district. Um, so uh, well, yes, these algorithms are used in cities across the US, uh, including New York City, Boston, Denver, and Washington DC. So some of the other inputs to these algorithms include priorities at each school. So schools can say, I'm going to give priority to students who live in the neighborhood, students who have a sibling at the school. And this allows the schools as well as the district to help guide the allocation of students to schools uh, for our goals such as proximity, uh, diversity, or giving special priority to historically disadvantaged groups. In addition, when it comes to diversity, the school choice literature has typically uh, tried to, to operationalize this using something called reserves or quotas. The idea was we're going to set aside seats for certain groups of students at different schools, and then these uh, reserves can, can then ensure that if students uh, of certain types want to go to a school, there are seats available to them. And if those seats are not filled up, then other students can then use those seats. And finally, there's also been some work in the context of Boston, looking at this, this middle ground that I talked about. Um, we don't restrict students to just one school, we don't give them choice over all schools, but we give them a smaller menu of schools to choose from. And so what we're bringing today that's a little bit different is the way that we're going to restrict choice is through these zones that contain a small number of schools in each zone. Okay, so drawing on the literature, we decided to explore uh, three types of policies that I'll show you today, and then a couple of other benchmark policies, which I won't talk about today. Uh, so the first set of policies we explored was zones. Here, we're going to restrict students to choose within a geographic zone. This is the closest to the policy concepts that were suggested by the district. And, and we took a little bit of uh, um, input from the school choice literature and, and added priorities within zones to try to guide the allocation a little bit. What you're seeing here, this picture is one illustrative example of zones. Uh, these were these were medium sized zones, which seem to be performing uh, relatively well. A second policy that we looked at was zones with reserves. So we mentioned that usually in the school choice literature, uh, in order to achieve diversity goals, you reserve certain seats for certain students. And so we decided to add on the reserves and see if that uh, improved our ability to achieve diversity goals. And then finally, a third policy I'm going to show you today is how the school choice literature would historically think about trying to guide toward some kind of district-wide goal, and that's through priorities alone. Uh, and so this the idea that um, if we give the right priority to the right students at every school, we can, in, in principle, achieve any of our distribution goals. Okay, so these are the three sets of policies where we went from the policy concepts suggested by the district, we augmented them, uh, using the uh, body of literature and school choice assignment. And we came up with these three sets of policies. The next thing we did is that each of these policies has a number of uh, decisions that need to be made. So you might be thinking already, well, how did I come up with this set of zones over here? 
And so I'll tell you next a little bit about how we suggested the specific zones and then how we evaluated all of the different policies. And, and this is the part where optimization and AI was, was really crucial uh, in order to, to check what do we expect to happen with all the different policies, what's even feasible. So when we were suggesting new policies, we had this question of which zones should we use? And so we used a, a zone optimization method in order to come up with many potential zones. Specifically, we used attendance areas as building blocks. The attendance area was that, that catchment area for each school. And then we used a, a math program or optimization approach to piece together these building blocks in a way that satisfies size, shape, and balance constraints. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about these in a moment, but what's important to note is that all of these constraints were just at the, the neighborhood level residentially, so before students choose schools. And then after we put together the zones, we generated lots of these zones and simulated counterfactual choice to evaluate the zones post-choice. Okay, but let me go back to these constraints that we had on the zones. The first set of constraints that we had were size and shape constraints. So size constraints you can think of as, do I want small zones? Uh, these are about three to five schools per zone, or I can set at the beginning, I want 13 zones. Uh, do I want medium zones? This is about eight to 12 schools, this is about eight zones. Uh, and then also thinking about the shape. Do I want my zones to be contiguous? That means every piece of the zone is connected to every other piece. Or, or am I allowing there to be islands? So for example, this zone in the bottom left or this uh, zone mapping in the bottom left uh, is small non-contiguous zones. You can see this purple zone over here is kind of split into three islands. And so we can put in uh, constraints that make the zones contiguous. We can also put in constraints that make the zones compact. So it's a little less snake-like. Uh, and we also put in a bunch of balance constraints. So balance of students across zones, balance of students and seats within zones, uh, the um, balance of diverse demographics uh, within zones, also similarity across zones, and also balance of school quality or pop uh, school performance or school popularity across zones. After we generated these zones, we wanted to evaluate them. And so here was where we used various tools from AI in order to predict how students would choose under these different policies. And so what we did was we took historical choice data from 2014 to 2019, and we asked a couple of prediction questions. We asked, how much will students like each school? Uh, which schools will students actually put on their list? And will students actually enroll in a school? Just a little bit more detail on each of those components. First, how much do students like each school? So typically how school choice uh, systems work is that you have to submit a rank ordered preference list. You tell me what's your first choice school, your second choice school, your third choice school. And so what we're trying to do here is estimate this, which one is your first choice, which one is your second choice, so on and so forth. And we estimate the, this uh, for, for those who know choice modeling um, using a number of different choice models. What I'm going to show you today is using just a multinomial logit, but we also have um, rank ordered logit uh, and um, context dependent logit as well. And, and what we do is we put student and school features into this, this model, for example, how far does the student live from the school? Um, how long does it take to travel from the student's home to the school? What language programs are available at the school versus the student's home language? Uh, also program and school fixed effects. And we asked how, how much does each of these components matter in, in predicting how students will choose schools? Next, we asked the question of will and should students list a school. And so, so here, this is uh, something that by and large has not been explored that much by the school choice literature. Uh, school choice literature says you're going to submit your rank ordered preferences over all the schools to this big algorithm. Okay? And so if you remember in San Francisco, there are about 70 something programs that students had to rank. And, and so that, that's a lot of programs to rank. And so what we find is that most families do not rank all schools. 
Uh, but in addition to that, families differ across race and socioeconomic status systematically in terms of how many schools they'll list. And so you can think this, this is going to affect assignment, right? Because the families that list a lot of schools are going to be more likely to be assigned to a school they listed than the families, for example, over here, or black families are listing on average only 3.4 schools in their list. Uh, and so we um, looked at the effect of kind of cutting off people's lists for them and how that affected uh, who was assigned where. And then we also uh, have some ongoing work looking at whether students will enroll in a school once they've been assigned to the school. Here we're using re regression trees to predict enrollment. And uh, the additional thing that we've added on top of choice modeling is we also include, well, not just the student and school features, but also how far down your list was this school. If you go to your fifth choice school, if you're assigned to your fifth choice school, are you going to be less likely to enroll than if you're assigned to your first or second choice? And all of these things matter when we think about what groups of students are going to end up at each of our schools. So that covers um, most of the methodology we used to suggest potential policies as well as to evaluate these policies. And so with that, I'm going to jump into uh, our results and the policy decision that these results informed. Uh, in this work, we weren't just doing a bunch of commuting, we, uh, computing, we also put together a number of policy decision support tools. I'm not going to have time to show you all of them today, but just to give you a sense of that entire pipeline of the decision making. Uh, we have the choice model I just told you about, where we try to predict how students would choose if we change the policy. Then we also put together the code uh, for how students are assigned. And so the piece that I told you about was just how do we decide on which zones to use? Uh, but then there is also just that, that algorithm that decides which students get to go to which schools once we have the zones. And so we coded all of that up for the district as well. Um, we also spent uh, quite a bit of time working with our colleagues in the education school to think you know, to come up with a whole suite of measures of predictability, proximity, diversity, choice, and equity of access. And then we also uh, have been working on some visualization tools, uh, both internally for district decision makers, as well as external community engagement tools. So I won't have time to show you all of these today, but what I will do is tell you a little bit about the, the results of our simulations on the policies. Okay, so, so how did we evaluate the policies? Uh, as I mentioned, we used historical data to estimate choice and specifically the data we used was we had student preferences as well as school priorities from 2013 through 2020. On top of that, we also had enrollment uh, for the following school year. And so in our simulations, what we did was we looked at applications to kindergarten. What I'm showing you today is just for the 2018-19 school year. Uh, there are also some nuances in terms of school assignment practically actually happens in a couple of different rounds. Uh, and so what I'm showing you today is using just the students who enter in round one, but we've also looked at what happens if we incorporate the multiple rounds. Uh, and today I, I'm not going to show you um, uh, our results on whether students will enroll or not, uh, but in order to correct for that a little bit, we removed the approximately 400 students who were assigned to their first choice school in 2018-19, but did not enroll in any school. And we kind of think these are this, this, the families who, um, no matter what we did with choice, they would go somewhere else, so to a private school, for example, and not enroll in SFUSD. And so we wanted to remove those students, so we're not counting them in our aggregate metrics. And then for preferences, we've run simulations using the historical preferences as well as using the choice model that I told you about. And so today, the results will be from the choice model. All of our results are also um, averaged over 100 simulations, and these simulations um, have different realizations of the randomness of uh, some, some randomness in the algorithm, which are called lotteries as well as randomness in the preferences, because when we're generating the preferences, this, this choice model actually gives us a way of randomly generating preferences. Okay. So what do we find? Here we're comparing our zones, zones and reserves, 
priorities policies, as well as the benchmark of the actual assignment in 2018 to 19. And we compared all of these across many different measures of predictability, proximity, diversity, and choice. But I'll be showing you today just one representative metric for each. Okay, so, so here's one example metric of diversity. This is the percentage of African-American, Latinx, and Pacific Islander students in schools um, with at least 67% of students eligible for free reduced price lunch. This number is 15% more than the district average. So you can kind of think of school these as mid to high poverty schools, which have a, a large concentration of poverty relative to the district average. And so that percent was 22% in the 2018-19 actual assignment. If we use just what the district had originally considered, just zones, and these are actually well-performing zones, if we use these well-performing zones, we can somewhat reduce that to 15%. But if we use more tools from uh, the school choice literature, such as reserves or priorities, we can get that number down even lower to 9% or 8%. Moving to the other district goals of predictability and proximity, I'm going to focus now just on proximity since this one's a little bit uh, more accessible or understandable. Here I'm looking at the average distance a student uh, lives, just bird's eye distance, from their assigned school. And so with the 2018-19 assignment, that number was 1.39 miles, we can, we can stay kind of close to that, improve a little bit, both with zones and zones and reserves. Uh, but if we use priorities, then students actually end up traveling even further to be able to go to their schools of choice. And then finally, choice was not a district goal, but we thought choice was important for a number of reasons, uh, including to predict enrollment. So that's still ongoing work. But just looking at the, the choice, the percent of students who are assigned to one of their top three schools, <coughs> the benchmark in 2018-19 was 80% of students. And so if we use priorities, this sort of traditional school choice approach, then it preserved choice right, quite well. Uh, choice percentage of students assigned to one of their top three schools is still around 74%. But if we restrict choice, then unsurprisingly, fewer students get one of the schools of their choice. And so based on these results, uh, the Board of Education decided, well, choice is not a policy goal. The policy goals are diversity, predictability, and proximity. And it seems that zones and reserves is best able to achieve all these policy goals. And so as a result, the proposed policy was to restrict choice using geographic zones, then use reserves to help control uh, the, the choice to improve diversity, and then also improve outcomes for target populations such as homeless students or students in foster care using what are called equity priorities. This, this will give these students top priority at all schools. Uh, the San Francisco Board of Education approved this policy in December 2020 for implementation starting the 2024-25 school year. Uh, but there are a number of challenges and considerations, even in the approval of the policy. So thinking about how do we mitigate the negative effects of reducing choice, uh, some of the other negative effects introduced by using zones and reserves. I'm happy to talk about what some of those are in the Q&A if you're interested. Uh, as well as, well, if we're reducing choice, then we should ensure that all families are still confident that their zone holds a, a school that is a good fit for them. And so there have been a lot of recent talks about the system changes that are required to ensure equitable zones that families have confidence in. Uh, for our research team, some of the next steps that we're supporting are the following. Thinking about some comparing these policies to benchmarks, so alternative simple policies. Uh, besides just the priorities policy that are informed by the school choice literature, as well as better in predicting enrollment. We're also working on a number of things in, in, in implementing the policy, supporting these system changes that I talked about, as well as evaluating uh, the performance of the policy. And so I'm happy to talk about these in more detail as well in the Q&A. With that, let me wrap up. What we've done is we've supported the development of a new student assignment policy in San Francisco using optimization and AI. So we started with district policy concepts. Uh, we used optimization and AI to, to augment the set of policy that were being considered and then also to evaluate them. And this led to the policy recommendation that was approved in 2020. 
So another way to look at what we did was we informed the proposal and, and we're now supporting the implementation of this new policy. And, and one of our hopes for this new policy is that it's going to reduce the concentration of racial minorities at high poverty schools, which should hopefully also then reduce these educational achievement gaps that are correlated with this confluence of concentration. And the final comment I want to make is that um, school assignment is not a, a, going to solve all our problems, uh, but hopefully what we've seen in this talk is that school assignment can be one of, of many policy changes that can together support more equitable access to educational opportunities and more equitable educational outcomes for all our students. And so with that, uh, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, the many members who have been involved um, in, some, in this work, but also the ongoing work that I mentioned at the end, and thank all of you for being here. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Irene, and I want to uh, remind uh, the audience, if you have uh, questions, uh, please add them uh, to, the, to the link that's provided in the, uh, in the chat window. Uh, several questions have already uh, come through. Uh, Irene, um, Maybe we could start with uh, start with this one. Uh, you know, considering the the complexity of the approach that you just described uh, and the potential of the approach that you just described, can you talk about uh, any challenges uh, you faced uh, when uh, the question is posed in terms of implementing this approach? But maybe we could talk more generally in terms of uh, you outlining to the district and getting buy in from the community. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I would say the the main challenge in this particular project was time. Um, so the policy decision um, was made on a very short timeline. And so um, what that meant was there are a number of things that we find are very important, but which we kind of had to do very quickly uh, during the, the research process and then also the policy decision process. So some of these included, um, I didn't tell you today anything about community engagement. And so there was some amount of community engagement that was largely run uh, by uh, by the district or by those who are more specialized in community engagement than I am. Um, but uh, one, yeah, one thing we, put, we ran into before was just having enough rounds of community engagement to really help families understand what were all these different policies that were being considered. And then now helping families really understand what is the process of deciding on the specific zone boundaries. So if you remember the policy didn't specify which zones, it just said that zones would be used. And so we're still working with the district now and specifying the zone boundaries. And again, uh, I'm just running into the issue of not having enough time for us to really understand the effects of zone boundaries. And then, so then it makes it difficult to help a whole community understand. But I think that's, that's so important. This policy is going to affect um, so many families uh, in a very personal and uh, um, uh, way with kind of long running uh, consequences. So, so that was one challenge we faced, and just in terms of timing. I, 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 Irene, I think part of what makes the uh, this project uh, so 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 challenging, uh, right, is we're talking about a dense urban area with uh, a lot of schools. You have a lot of uh, a lot of households that are packed closely together, right. Um, but along with that being a challenge, that also lends itself to to an opportunity along the lines that you you described today about. Uh, create you know creating new, new zoning uh, procedures uh, and algorithms that can uh, leverage people's sort of desires and, and, and funnel them through in a way uh, that can promote uh, ideals around you know diversity and, and, and equity and so forth. Um, but but the, one 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 question came uh, came uh, through the channel that was about uh, is this is this approach. Uh, conducive for school choice policies not in cities uh right where folks are mm -hmm. are, are living not yeah. so closely together yeah yeah that's that's such a great question um i would say school choice in general uh tends to have been used more in cities just because as the question asker rightly pointed out you kind of need this density of where students are living um, what we were doing today with the zone optimization, I think, can be more general um, in the sense that um, basically any district uses some kind of zoning or some deciding what should be the boundaries be of our catchment areas. And so uh, I think um, the, the question of how, how can we build these catchment areas in a way that 
actually supports integration is one that's relevant in any school district. The specific complexity we added of having choice on top of that, I think, is more relevant um, in these urban, very highly populated areas. Okay, good. Um, so I guess there's, there's a couple questions that are uh, not mechanical, kind of practical questions with regard to uh, your, your approach and more about presumed impacts of this approach for student populations, for districts more generally. Uh, one, one question um, is how can diversity support practical success um, and improve educational processes uh, in schools in San Francisco school district? Uh, and, and is the thought that you know, implementing diversity methods uh, is, is the thought that that we can implement diversity methods in kind of all schools across the world and would we be better off if we were to do that? Yeah, you know, that's that's such a great question and, and one that I'm there's a wealth of literature on this of which I am not an expert and so I will do my best to give my, my view. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a question of is is diversity alone in all our schools sort of the end goal there I would say no right and I think the district would agree with me that Diversity is the start, the, the, the goals are integration, uh, and then also um, kind of seeing those, um, the, the positive effects on educational outcomes that diversity can have in an integrated school. And so uh, this is going a little bit um, uh, orthogonal to the question, but um, one thing that um, is, I mentioned is starting to happen in the district, which I'm very excited about, is that uh, the new policy of zones has started enabling um, many other conversations about, okay, if we want um, equitable zones, what kinds of programs do we need? Where do our language programs or before and after school programs need to be so that everyone has more equitable access, where it's much easier now to define what we mean by equitable access. It means you have one in your zone and you have an opportunity to go there. Um, uh, another thing that zones is enabling is, uh, Again, this is a little orthogonal to your question, but uh, thinking about transportation. And so what is everyone's ability to actually access schools? If, if I say you can go to any school in the district, but there, you have no way of physically getting there, then that's not real access. Um, and so, um, yeah, this is, yeah. and then the, the third set of things that I, I would love to see, um, I haven't, I'm not sure if there's been a specific commitment to this yet from the district is just um, all the other training for, for teachers, for principals, for families, for students that help you go from just a, a diverse school where there are many different people from different backgrounds to an integrated school where people really understand um, how to interact, um, what, what sort of the, the minority experience is and how that differs from the majority experience. Um, yeah, so I think those are a scattering of thoughts that were prompted by your question. I hope they addressed your question. Yeah, uh, so uh, San Francisco Unified School District has had one form of school choice or been characterized by one form of school choice for several, uh, several, several decades now. Um, I, there's, a, there's a question around uh, the arguments against school choice and the extent to which your proposed solution addresses those uh right and, and maybe i can speak to this just for one moment and then get your 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 response to it right uh you know it's just so much of the public's so much of certain segments of the public's uh, resistance to school choice uh policies more generally uh, have to do with uh, really the the erosion of what's uh, uh kind of generally uh understood as like neighborhood schools uh right and it's it's a belief that that neighborhood schools uh can serve as pillars of, of community uh not just in in like any moment, but really across generations, uh, right? Uh, and by expanding school choice, it undermines it undermines the neighborhood. It un undermines local school uh, control. It, it undermines uh, it undermines some of the continuity uh, that students can experience uh, really within their within their their, their own neighborhoods, uh, right? So that's that's sort of a, a high level uh, sort of. Uh, 
framing of, of, of why folks are, are uh, why some folks can be resistant to the idea of school choice uh, and more generally sort of the the, the marketization of, of, of uh, the educational system uh, in the ways that you know competition isn't uh, you know it isn't always conducive for sort of promoting equity uh, within within schools um, moreover there's concerns around uh, really, when we talk about school choice, there's only but there, there's this concern or, or, or critique that only certain uh, segments of the population really have choice, um, mm -hmm. right? There's this assumption that mm -hmm. okay, school choice, everyone has it, but in 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 in, in uh, you know actuality, uh, you know the, the ability to to realize or act on uh, school choices or even be aware of school choices can yeah. vary quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And what's what's concerning is that that variation is also predicted by socioeconomic differences, right, racial differences. Mm -hmm. So yeah. with all that said, um, can you talk a, a little bit about uh, the ways that this policy addresses or does not address, and I said policy, but really this approach, addresses mm -hmm. or does not address some of those concerns around uh, school choice? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And thank you for naming some of the uh, criticisms of school choice for me. Um, I would say what I, um, what I like about the zones approach, which um, uh, I'm happy to also talk offline with anyone who's interested in other approaches from school choice. Um, what I like about the zones approach that some of these other approaches don't get is that it kind of preserves some of that community cohesion or that neighborhood feel, uh, the sense that you have a, a small geographic unit that kind of persists over time um, and where you can build community, build trust, um, build uh, yeah, kind of have everyone invested in the schools. And so uh, I agree that that's, that's easier to achieve when you have neighborhood schools. At the same time, we see in a district like San Francisco, um, if we use neighborhood schools, then uh, there are going to be poor schools and there are going to be rich schools, right? And so what this intermediate approach allows us to do is expand that um, that community to beyond one school to to a slightly larger set of schools and so you, you could imagine doing this with with not um, these medium zones which have you know 10 to 12 schools but with a smaller set of zones that have only three to five schools and so such an approach could uh, go part of the way to creating that sense of community and belonging within the zone now rather than the school um, while also somewhat mitigating the, the residential segregation so that what we see in our medium zones in particular is that they're much more socioeconomically representative and, and somewhat more racially representative than the, the neighborhoods that we're able to draw and, and even compared to small zones even small zones in san francisco were still quite uh, racially and socioeconomically segregated and so this how, how big the zones have to be is kind of something you can adjust district by district, depending on the geography of the segregation in the district. So, so moving from kind of general reflections on school choice and uh, implications for what we think this work might might mean back down to a very practical question about kind of the mechanics of how you arrived at uh, the solution that you uh, detail today. Uh, can, can you elaborate how you acquired the data uh, from uh, the choice for the choice modeling uh, and what were the challenges associated with that? Yeah, so uh, the data was very generously uh, provided for us by the San Francisco Unified School District. Uh, the data was um, the historical choice data. So since 2011, San Francisco has been using uh, a district-wide choice, which is where families submit a rank order list of their preferences, um, and that's put into an algorithm to decide where they get to go to school. And so we were able to see these rank ordered lists, uh, as well as um, other records of student features, like what is um, their race, um, some aggregate statistic of socioeconomic status, and, and a couple of other things. Um, some challenges with using this data. Um, this data is actually quite clean, but some of the challenges we faced were um, we, we had to make an assumption that um, the reported preferences were the true preferences, so that what people said was their list of schools they want to go to was actually their list. We, we don't know that that's necessarily true. Um, we also, um, the data we have on student characteristics like race is not necessarily updated very frequently. And so we're not sure how, how good of an estimate we have of like how uh, racial composition is changing over the years. 
um, and what and, and, and a big assumption behind all of our work is that we're assuming that historical choice, historical kind of demographics are going to be uh, predictive of what's going to happen in the future. And so if we think about, for example, just some of the high level shifts in the district in the past two years due to COVID, there have been a lot of families who have been leaving the district. And so even the composition of families in the district has changed drastically. Um, and so that's one of the challenges we're facing in trying to predict um, in enrollment. Um, even if historical choice was predictive enrollment, we don't have quite enough data to predict it well. And now we'll, we, we have a sense that um, sort of historical enrollment choice is, is not going to be very predictive of future enrollment choice. And so that's one of the challenges we're facing. Uh, as we close, Irene, can you talk a little, can you peer forward uh, for a moment? Uh, let us know your, your plans, right? We, we've got, uh, you know, what, what appears to be a very promising approach for uh, addressing prevailing issues of segregation uh, and inequality and, and sort of the, the vestiges of past residential segregation in cities. Um, you know, you've, you've provided for us a, a really neat framework and an approach that districts can use, um, you know, as evidenced by, you know, your work with SFUSD. Uh, do you have plans on using, uh, you have plans in, uh, to work with other districts? Do you have plans to work in other states? Uh, can you just talk a little bit about uh, what the five-year plan is for this project? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for asking. So, um, no, we, we would love to scale beyond uh, working with just San Francisco. So if you are in another school district or know of another school district that is facing um, issues either with diversity and school choice or diversity and zoning, um, please do feel free to come talk to us. Um, a lot of the, uh, the computational and data support tools, uh, decision support tools that I mentioned but didn't show you, we're trying to build uh, uh, flexible versions of those that can be um, translated and used in other districts as well. And so yeah, if we're thinking about the two to three year plan, it's really building up those tools so that they are flexible and it takes a very short amount of time to modify them for use in a different district. And then the five year plan would be to partner with a small number of other districts and go through a process that's specific to the needs of that district. Great. Well, uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you again, Irene, for joining us. And thank you to our audience uh, for your thoughtful uh, questions and engagement. The next HAI seminar will be on uh, May 18th. Uh, you can find more information on the HAI uh, website. Uh, thank you again, Irene, and thank you all for attending today. Yes, and thank you, Francis, for moderating and everyone for attending.